It used to be just for cars and trucks, but with today's consumers seemingly crossover crazy, there's now a third category that jurors consider for the North American Car, Truck, and now Utility of the Year Awards. We'll look at the nine finalists and make some predictions, coming up next on AutoLine This Week. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. Say, what is the best new car of the year and the best utility and the best truck? We're going to get to the bottom of it in today's show because joining me are three of the jurors for the North American Car and Truck and Utility of the Year Award, including Chris Pockert with Roadshow by CNET. Joining us today, too, is Mark Phelan, the car critic with the Detroit Free Press, and... Joanne Muller with Forbes. I want to thank all three of you for joining us here today. But Joanne, I'm going to start with you. Uh, let's discuss the car category. The three finalists for Car of the Year, which include the Toyota Camry, the Honda Accord, and the Kia Stinger. Let's start out with the Toyota Camry. What are your thoughts about the car? Should it be the Car of the Year? Well, certainly it is a vastly improved uh, Camry. Uh, really, the styling is improved a lot. Um, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say that uh, I've seen a lot of commercials of people gleefully screaming their heads off while driving the Camry, and I didn't quite get that excited about driving it. <laughs> okay. So, let's, Mr. Phelan, what's your, what's your thoughts on the Toyota Camry? Well, first of all, I, I think it's worth pointing out that two of them are mid-sized sedans, the segment that we keep declaring dead. So it, it, it's not where it used to be, but it's still important. You know, the, the Camry it is certainly a great improvement from previous Camrys. Toyota, God love them, for years they've been saying that we are going to become a design-driven company. And that really actually shows up in, in the look of uh, the, the Camry. I feel like it's more of a, an improvement from the a previous car than necessarily a great step for the whole industry. Mm. Well, your, your thoughts, Chris? I agree completely. I think, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle that makes a statement styling-wise that it never has before. I think the interior quality is way better than it was previously. Uh, the only problem is now that there's an Accord in the mix. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll get to the Accord in a minute, but I got to tell you, I, I was knocked out by the Camry. This is the best Toyota Camry that's ever been put on the road Agreed. before. No one would argue with that. Yeah, and, and I got to tell you, for me personally, and it came down to the Accord, and we'll get into that right now in a minute, but... Boy, they were awfully close, awfully close in my book. But I don't know, seems to me that you're giving me a face there, <laughs> Joanne. You like the Honda Accord. I did. You know, what I, what I would say is that uh, Toyota made a better Camry. Honda made a better midsize sedan. And uh, to me, the Honda is just very fun to drive, which, you know, for a midsize sedan, you're like, eh, maybe not so exciting. But it's really good, and especially the six-speed um, manual was my favorite. Um, well, that's good. They'll sell about three of them. I know. I know. We always know those are, those are more fun. But um, it, nonetheless, I think that the Accord, uh, uh, I, I also give Honda great credit for bringing back some buttons and knobs on their infotainment system, which has been a pet peeve of mine and kept me from recommending Hondas to friends. It's like, great car. We always know they make great cars but their infotainment system stunk. Now it's better. And that, Jeez, uh, who, who knew it would so easy? Just put some buttons and knobs <laughs> and you get recommendations. Sorry, Chris, I cut you off. No, I think that's an excellent point. And I think what we've seen is that the car is better to drive. It's more entertaining, but it also delivers on the fundamentals. So for instance, the styling is way more evocative than it used to be. It's almost that four-door coupe styling, mm -hmm. um, but it's a magic act. It's actually bigger inside and bigger in the back seat. Um, than most of its competitors. It's got a bigger trunk, and yet you don't have to do the duck in to get in and out thing that you had to do with, for instance, if we remember the quite nicely styled Chrysler 200 that I think a lot of people would rather forget. Um, it's, it does all of the things really well. The only problem for me with the Accord is actually that Acura has you know, a vehicle in the, that actually doesn't feel as good now as that, even though they've given the refresh to the TLX. Yeah, but that's Acura's problem, not Honda's <laughs> problem. And Acura's got a long list of problems. But, but, but I agree with you. I mean, the space inside the Accord is fantastic. Yeah. Um, in, in some ways, I, I think Camry and Accord are sort of illustrative of the differences between Honda and Toyota. Toyota, they didn't change much technology. They're still you know, V6. They're still six-speed maybe eight-speed, I, I frankly you know, forget, uh, automatic uh, transmission. Um, Honda, they went all turbocharged lineup. They added a 10-speed 
uh, automatic that works beautifully. And they do have just acres of space inside, uh, which is part of what makes this whole thing interesting because you know, we've got two mid-sized sedans going up against something that's very different. And we'll get to that in a minute, but I just want to finish uh, talking about the Camry on this point. Man, is that hybrid good. The Camry hybrid matches the fuel economy of the base Toyota Prius. And remember, the Toyota Prius is designed from the ground up to be a hybrid. And it's much it, smaller. And it's much smaller and lighter, and it's supposed to be the best, and the Camry matches it. That takes engineering, and I, I, I think that's indicative of the effort that Toyota put into the Camry. The, the hybrid is the Camry's strongest card to play, I think. But I, th I think we also have to give them credit. Without going to a small turbocharged engine, they, they also still managed to be in the contention for best-in-class fuel economy with the V6, which is a bit of a magic act as well. Yeah, it is. Okay, let's turn to the Kia Stinger. Joanne, what do you think? Well, uh, this really elevates the brand for sure for uh, for Kia. I mean, no, I don't think anybody expected a car like this, right? Um, uh, You're saying it's good. It's good. It's good. It's fun to drive. It's uh, good looking. I remember being at a restaurant where it was parked outside and people just stopping and looking at it. The paint job on that particular car was really cool. They have sort of this... Um, I don't know, battleship gray thing that's not shiny. I, I don't even know what it's called, but it's, it looks cool. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, I don't know how many of them they'll sell. Uh, I really don't know. I now you're coming to my point, but yeah. let, let, let's hear what, yeah. uh, let, Chris, what do you think about the Stinger? Uh, well, I think in terms of market impact, you're right. We have no idea how much this is going to sell. Um, but I think it's the most ambitious product of the three for sure. Um, it takes real nerve for a company like Kia to put their vehicle up against vehicles that are class or two above in terms of price and prestige. We went out to the Proving Grounds, and of course, that's their home turf, but we went out there and they had BMWs, they had a Porsche Panamera. That is absurd. But the thing is, it's got the performance to deliver that. Does it have the interior refinement? Not quite as much. But for the money and for the package size, the utility, the fuel economy, everything, it's it's a really impressive product. Sure, it's only $70,000 cheaper than a Panamera. You, you, you can't expect it to have the same interior. Right. Mark, what do you think, Stinger? Ah, the Stinger is better than I thought Kia could build. It, it's remarkably good, um, and it's terrific value, as you say. I mean, it, it delivers the room, the, the, the handling, the, the performance of cars that cost $30,000, $40,000 more, and it looks good. It is a terrific, it's an amazing first step for a brand trying to do this kind of thing. Um, I, I think that uh, it, is, it has made me think of Kia in a different way, which is its, its main job. Yeah, but will it change the public's perception? You know, we're all gearheads. We test drive everything. I think enthusiasts are going to love the Stinger. End of story. I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I, look, I, I think what they've done with the car is brilliant. I don't think it's gonna sell very well, not because of a problem with the car. That segment just isn't selling all that well. And I'm not sure that this is the car that's going to change the public's perception. The enthusiast public, yes, not the rest, the 90% of the other public that buys cars. Well, I would add, though, that Kia has been making a very steady march uh, forward in terms of its brand reputation. And uh, it doesn't hurt that their cars are coming up at the top of initial quality studies and so forth. Uh, uh, people are surprised to find that out. What Kia offers is a ton of value in in all of their vehicles, a ton of value for the money. And um, the, the Stinger is just an extension of that, right? It's just a question of, you know, is that the kind of car that's going to sell a lot? I don't know. But. Well, and, and it's dramatically better than anything else they've done. But, but you both make the, the point, it's not the hottest part of the, the market, which raises the question, would have they, they have been better off to do a legitimate luxury SUV first? which is probably their next step. And in terms of sales numbers, the, you know, they probably would, but you know, the Stinger is what we've got to, to, to consider this year. Well, look, they, they considered that they had to go after the enthusiast market. And as you guys know, they hired a key uh, engineering management guy away from BMW to put his savvy into turning out a car like we got with the Stinger. And man, did they deliver. And I think that'll pay dividends um, throughout the entire process. I think, you know, we're finding that this vehicle drives really beautifully and we'll see that DNA kind of you know, seep into everything from crossovers to other vehicles because the, the issue with Kia for a long time is they were able to deliver on value. They were even able to deliver on styling and quality lately, but that last little bit of tuning, that suspension discipline, the steering feel, they didn't have that. 
Um, and that kept them from being in the same conversation. I mean, th this is a company that's never really won a major award outside of resale value or you know something along those lines. They haven't won. So this is easily the most ambitious product of this group that we have here, I would argue, in all three categories. Um, and I think that's to be celebrated. Yeah, although Joanne made a great point. They've come out at the top of the J.D. Power Initial Quality Survey, and that's really saying something. It is. Okay, let's move to the next category, the utilities, in which we have the Alfa Romeo Stelvio, the Volvo XC60, and the Honda Odyssey minivan. Mark, let's start with you, and let's start with the Stelvio. It's gorgeous. It's fun to drive. Um, Alfa Romeo is on a roll at the moment because they just won Motor Trends uh, Car of the Year uh, in uh, a, a, a surprising victory, I think, to most for the Julia. Uh, so Alfa Romeo is a, a brand that uh, attention needs to be paid to at the moment. Um, it is a, a niche vehicle, and you know it has not yet, even though it's in a hot part of the market, really made a significant difference for Alfa Romeo sales or how people think of the brand. And I think the traditional questions about uh, quality are still out there. Mm. Your thoughts, Chris? Uh, once again, couldn't agree more. Um, it is a beautifully styled SUV, um, and it's funny how Alfa Romeo styling seems to translate beautifully to just about any form you put on it. That can't be said for every automaker. Um, and it is fun to drive, um, but I feel like the interior is a little subpar in places, um, and the infotainment's not so great. And uh, I, as, as a whole package, you know, it, it's competitive with things like the, the Jag F-Pace, but even that's not really hard of the market right now. Um, and as you pointed out, sales have not taken off for this model. And, and quality well, it's still early. I, I, I'll give them that. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, I, I, I wouldn't judge the sales on what's going on at this snapshot in time. Now, if in even just three months you say the same thing, wow, watch out. But Joanne, your thoughts? Alpha Stelvio. Italian styling. It's just <laughs> gorgeous. I love getting in that car, especially the one with the light interior and the wood grain. I mean, the wood in that car is unlike any other wood I've seen in a car. It smells good. It's beautiful. I love the way it looks in my driveway. It's beautiful. It's different. And that's hard to say in a, in a category that's so overrun with product right now that a, a, an SUV can actually look sort of unique. So I give them huge credit on styling. Love it. Yeah. I hate the infotainment system. Um, so that to me infotainment is one of the most important criteria when what, i evaluate a car what do you <clears throat> not like about it um uh you have to you have to take too many steps to change the channel on the radio or um or to get to anything and it's not the icons are not large and intuitive and so i'm moving knobs around and trying to figure out which knob is the one that's going to move uh you know make the operation i want and, mm -hmm. and Fiat Chrysler has got, I think, arguably the best infotainment system in the business with Uconnect yes. in, in the traditional Chrysler brands. Right. And for some reason, Alpha decided to reinvent the inter infotainment system for this instead of just taking a system that already it's worked. It's actually kind of similar to the one in the Mazda, right? With those uh, left and right thing. I think it's uh, it's similar. I, I just, to me, I spent, I'm, if I'm going to spend a lot of time in a car, I have to be able to operate it easily. And to me, infotainment has risen to the top of my list of criteria. Yeah, and it, especially as we evaluate these vehicles, they're all so good. You yes. get down into the granular analysis of this is better than that. And so uh, your point on the infotainment system is really important. And, and you know, when people ask me what car should I buy, um, you know, a lot of times I feel like they already have their mind made up, right? They're just looking for validation, right? But I always tell them, spend time in the car operating all the controls because people don't do enough of that they look at you know the styling the color you know whether it has the right engine that they want whatever they drive it around the block and they're like yeah i can't wait to go home with my new car you're going to hate it if you can't operate the system it's, a, it's an excellent point and it's something that some of those uh, infotainment systems can sell vehicles in the dealership when you're sitting there in a static environment yes. and they, the, the beautiful splash screen comes yes. up and you're yes. like, wow, look at this. Yeah. I, you know, if you're somebody that's a typical consumer and you've walked in, you've got a vehicle that's six or seven years old, you, you may not have navigation right. in your car. You don't have that splash screen that comes up in the infotainment cluster. All that stuff is a gee whiz feature, but the reality is, is how does it operate in daily life? I, I would argue that if you are predisposed to 
wanting something like an Alfa Romeo, you're already a bit of a corner case to begin with. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a heart, not a head purchase. Okay. Um, and I think that people who are interested in that type of vehicle that want the sexy noise and the beautiful sheet metal um, and the, the kind of iconoclastic styling and, and image, they'll get that with this vehicle. Um, but they'll also have to put up with a lot of the little niggles and potentially quality issues that have you know, been the, the drawback to that brand for so long. Okay, let's get to the next one on my list. Mark, Volvo XC60. Ah, you know, Volvo, another brand that's been on a roll. Um, and the, the XC60 for me is about style and safety. It, it looks terrific. It shows that their styling team can you know, work on smaller vehicles. Uh, and the amount of safety equipment that they are putting on it from the very base is extremely impressive. Uh, it, it, it's a real value story. Mm -hmm. Joanne, what's your thought? Uh, I would agree with Mark. I'd add that um, when I sit inside a Volvo, I just feel so relaxed. Um, there's something about the character of the interior of the vehicles. Um, the Swedish design, I guess, I don't know. It just, it's comfortable. It, it just feels safe, even mm -hmm. when you're not moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> safe, but not boring. Right. Right, right. because they've got that Scandinavian design, that, mm. that Swedish essentialism to everything, the, the beautiful way the wood is, um, cut on a bias and, and it's matte and all that. They're, they're beautifully crafted interiors. Um, the thing that's been the hang up with me for newer generation Volvos is powertrain refinement and ride quality because they fit a lot of these cars with this, these massive beautiful looking wheels and this watch strap rubber and it kills the ride quality. This vehicle to me rides a little bit better than the XC90 which could be problematic in the inscription higher end trim um, even though it has the, the shorter wheelbase than the XC90. Um, so I, I appreciate that about it. Uh, I think it's a really compelling package all the way around and um, I, I mean they're just doing incredible things as a company um, in terms of how they're looking at the ownership model, how they're looking at electrification. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting vehicle. I just hope that the quality is there. Yeah. So what you're saying too is don't buy the big optional wheels. They may look great, but they're not going to ride and handle as well. They're probably fine out in California for short jaunts on mountain roads and such, but you know, here in the, in the frigid mi Midwest, ill-suited. Yeah, I'll add one more thing to uh, the XC60. Everybody loves the new car smell. Man, do they have the best yes. new car smell. <laughs> I don't know if it's the leather, the wood, or they spray something in there or whatever it is, but man, Best new car smell in the business. So I'll say that about the XC60, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. But Joanne, yeah. Honda Odyssey is also on the list. Oh, the minivan. Oh, my favorite. I, uh, and it's my favorite for a very funny story. <laughs> I took my family on vacation in a uh, Odyssey. And as we were getting ready to go, my husband was playing around with the rear screen entertainment system and discovered um, that there was porn streaming into the back. <laughs> Of the car. <laughs> not standard equipment. <laughs> no. <laughs> Needless to say, I have to give Honda credit. They did not know. This was through their epic uh, uh, streaming service. They did not know that there was a porn channel available. Huge mistake oversight by some engineers. But I give Honda credit. <laughs> they took care of it within an hour. It was off every car that was on a lot or in someone's driveway. No longer available. Now, the funny thing is that not they had, had sold 5,000 of these cars with rear seat entertainment systems, hadn't received one complaint. <laughs> what does that tell you about minivan owners? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, your thoughts, Honda um, Odyssey. It's an awfully good vehicle. I, I, I think that uh, it, its you know, greatest competition, frankly, is the vehicle that won last year, the Chrysler, Chrysler Pacifica, which is uh, an awfully good uh, minivan as well. And it sort of raised the stakes for minivans a little bit by having a really good plug-in hybrid version that could cover uh, 30 miles uh, on a charge. Uh, um, uh, the Pacifica. The Pacifica, yeah, yes. Right. Um, the Odyssey is, is arguably the best minivan in all ways except for the failure to offer some kind of uh, a, a, you know, alternate fuel version like that. And I think that that is going to you know, weigh in, in my voting when I consider it. But God, it's a good minivan. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Chris? Uh, I think it r takes everything about the Odyssey, which we loved, and distills it down and makes it even better. The ride quality is better. The switch gear feel is better. There's a lot of clever family-friendly tech um, you know, that you can kind of talk to the people in the way, way back using the microphone system. These are real world solutions. And I think people in that segment care about it. Now, I do think that, you know, we talked about the contraction of, of sedans. We should probably talk about the fact that minivans aren't what they used to be in sales 
um, compared to crossovers now. That's definitely the growth market. And this isn't a hugely innovative product overall. It's just a really nicely executed one. Yeah, and you know, I think that it's possible the minivan segment will make something of a comeback because we're starting to see millennials get jobs. We're starting to see them get married. They're gonna have kids and you know, as much as some people hate them, man, if you've got kids, the best thing to have is a minivan. It's just too practical to ignore. And, and you mean as much as some people hate minivans, not kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that. <laughs> but both are true. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last ca category, the truck category, where we've got the Ford Expedition, the Lincoln Navigator, and the Chevrolet Colorado ZR2. Uh, Chris, let's start with you and Expedition. Well, I, that's good because I actually drove one to the studio here today. Uh, tremendously refined vehicle. And I will tell you that the old one, which was really long in the tooth, still aged quite well, I think, especially when they did the powertrain update, which this vehicle still has the 3.5 liter twin turbo, which is just a powerhouse. Uh, but now it has the interior quality refinement and um, the, you know, the full hand of advanced driver assist systems that weren't available really in this segment at all before. Um, it's aluminum intensive architecture. So there's, there's innovation happening here. Um, the version that I drove here is the top flight platinum spec. It is not cheap. Uh, it is $82,000, which is squarely in navigator territory, um, but it has the interior to pull it off. You mean, you mean it's that well done? It's really beautifully done. Mm. Mark, what are your thoughts? I, it's a fascinating vehicle because Ford has, for almost a generation, been trying to come up with a vehicle that is a legitimate competitor to the Chevrolet Suburban, which you know dominates that that segment. And they've always been an also ran. And now, as Chris pointed out, they've updated completely. It's on the a modified version of the same frame as the new F-150. It's got aluminum uh, body panels. It's got a very impressive engine and transmission. I mean, th th this is a, a, a serious, uh, big, uh, you know, great trailer towing capacity uh, SUV. Yeah, yeah it's, it's bigger. So it's bigger than it used to be, and it's lighter, and it tows over 9,000 pounds. I mean, it, it's got a lot of things going for it, for sure. Yeah, Joanne, you like it? Um, yeah, I haven't spent as much time as it, uh, in it as I would like to, so I have to spend some more time uh, in the coming weeks before we vote. Um, y you know, I, uh, they, both uh, the Expedition and the Navigator are such huge vehicles. To me, um, unless you're towing something and and you know hopefully the customers who are buying this are buying it for that reason i think it's overkill <laughs> yeah uh, you know i mean there it's lovely you know i i think there's a lot of equipment there and a lot of refinement as you say but uh, with so many other choices that are smaller and more usable I, I you know i don't really see this category being all that important to well, me. And if I could point something out, the reason that the uh, NACTA juror, uh, jury put the Expedition and Navigator in the in the truck segment is almost exactly what uh, Joanne's talking about, that these are vehicles for which towing capacity is one of the prime reasons people buy it, which is similar to pickups and very different from a vehicle like the Volvo XC60. Uh, so that that's why these vehicles are competing uh, with uh, a, a pickup truck in the truck category. But I still see so many moms driving around my neighborhood you know, with one cup of coffee in their hand and nobody in the back two rows. And I, it's, it's insane to me. Oh, that's because they had to drive their kids a half a block to get to the school bus yes, stop. Yes, they did. <laughs> well, okay, let's move over to its cousin vehicle, the, the Lincoln Navigator. So it has many of the same attributes. For me, the styling is not as compelling as it is in the Expedition, but this is a, a vehicle that's sort of larger than life and you need a little bit of a, you know. Some a, bling. You need a little swagger to, to be, you know, in this market in the same way that you would be for an Escalade. Um, I, I think, you know, based on the, the refinement and the economy, and I, I need more time with this vehicle too, but I think it outpoints the Escalade. I think it's a, it's a better Escalade. Um, whether people can get their arms around the styling is another question. Okay, a any other additions to the I'm five foot one. I love the fact that when I open the door, the uh, step comes out and I can get in easily without having to grab onto the steering wheel and hoist myself up. Yeah. And the interior is loaded with thoughtful little touches that are the kind of thing that a luxury owner will tell stories about. It, it, it's a, I think Lincoln in some ways understands luxury owners better than Cadillac. Yeah, wow, that's saying a lot right there. Okay, last vehicle in the list, the Colorado ZR2. Well, this is different in that it is a derivative of an existing model, the Colorado midsize pickup that we know and love already. 
uh, has this new super capable off-road version, but it, it so redefines that vehicle's character, that, that the skill set, the off-road ability. Um, it, it's not a rock crawler, you know, it can, it can power through its speed. Um, it's got these amazing Multimatic shocks. Um, and I think it's, it's a fun vehicle. Now, it's quite expensive and it didn't get a power boost. Um, so it may be a bit of a corner case, but it's, it's nice to have it there. Okay, now we're down, getting down to the last minute here, so Mark and Joanne, I need quick comments. Chevy's bid to make a serious uh, off-road pickup. Okay, Joanne? I have nothing to add. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to put you all on the spot. Car of the year is going to be? Uh, in a shock surprise, I think the Stinger will take it. Okay, Mark? I suspect Accord. Okay. Accord. I vote Accord, too. Utilities, which one's going to win it? Expedition. No, 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 utility. Oh, I, I, that's yeah. my, that's my, why our category. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my apologies. XC60. XC60? XC60. Volvo XC60. Volvo XC60 here. Okay. Now you can say Expedition. Expedition. Okay. Navigator. Navigator. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know which one it's going to be. I didn't see, think ZR2. ZR2, sorry. No, look, I, I think the ZR2 is an awesome awesome truck. I don't think it's worthy of truck of the year because it's not all new. It, it, it's a great modification of an existing truck, but unlike the, the Expedition and the Navigator, which are all new, that, that, my, my vote's going to go to one or either of them. Hey, look, we got to uh, wrap it up here. Chris Pocker, Mark Phelan, Joanne Muller, you guys are awesome. What a great show. And we're soon going to know what the real winners are.